All right, well, let's begin with a little bit of uh, biographical material the Apostle Paul gives to us and from a very familiar uh, letter, a letter to the Philippians, and I'd like to read for you the first uh, 17 verses of Philippians chapter 3. And we'll look at some things in here and also in some other places as well. But uh, what we want to focus on is the zeal that Paul had. And of course, we're asking the question, actually, we're trying to prove the point, what it is that gave him that zeal. And that was his love, his affection for the Lord Jesus. If you love little, you do little. But if you love a lot, you do a lot. Philippians 3, beginning in verse 1, Paul writes this, Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things again is no trouble to me, and it is a safeguard for you. Beware of the dogs, beware of the evil workers, beware of the false circumcision, for we are the true circumcision who worship in the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh, although I myself might have confidence even in the flesh. If anyone has a mind to put confidence in the flesh, I far more. Circumcise the eighth day of the nation of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to the righteousness which is in the law, found blameless. But whatever things were gained to me, those things I have counted as loss for the sake of Christ. More than that, I count all things to be loss in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them but rubbish so that I may gain Christ and may be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death in order that I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already attained it or obtained it or have already become perfect, but I press on so that I may lay hold of that for which also I was laid hold of by Christ Jesus. Brethren, I do not regard myself as having laid hold of it yet. But one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and reaching forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Let us, therefore, as many as are perfect, have this attitude. And if in anything you have a different attitude, God will reveal that also to you. However, let us keep living by that same standard to which we have attained. Brethren, join in following my example and observe those who walk according to the pattern you have in us. So one thing just to note from that point is that last verse. He says, join in following my example. So everything he said about his pursuit is something that we should be pursuing as well. Now this morning we saw again how love for the Lord works itself out uh, in the life through the example of David. I think we'd all agree David had a very strong love. He had a very strong affection for the Lord. Uh, David put the Lord at the center of his life. Uh, and again, that's because of his love. He made God his portion, his inheritance. We might say that there was really nothing David needed other than the Lord. He was precious, he was beautiful to him. We saw that David wanted to be near him. He wanted to have communion with him. Um, you know, it's interesting that the language of Psalm 63 and Psalm 42 is very similar, isn't it? Uh, that David uh, talks about his desire to be near to the Lord as being in the wilderness and parched and having this thirst. And yet the psalmist in Psalm 42 talks about as the deer pants for the water brook. So again, this idea of thirsting. Well, David thirsted for the Lord. He had this spiritual desire to be near him. And so he sought the Lord. Uh, he wanted to see the, 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 the Lord's face early in the morning. And he wanted to enjoy that communion with him all throughout the day to meditate on him, what he, you know, who he is and, and what he has done in order that he might know everything he could about him. We also saw how David really looked for God's glory everywhere. Everywhere God revealed it, in the creation, especially the starry heavens, 
through his law in his people. And when he saw those things about God and saw his glory, he, he praised him and worshipped him for it. And he was also very careful to point that out also to others, that they might praise him as well. And we saw that David trusted the Lord. You know, he, he loved him enough to consider him trustworthy. So he trusted him for everything from his daily bread to his forgiveness, his guidance, his protection, and his security, and most importantly, his everlasting happiness. Uh, the Bible calls David a, a man after God's own heart, and the reason why was because he loved the Lord and made him all these things to himself. God was at the center of his life. Well, this is what the Spirit would have us strive to be. It would be men and women after God's own heart. Now this evening, let's consider another example of how this love of God works itself out in the life, and this time we want to see this in the Apostle Paul. Now Paul is perhaps, I think arguably, and I think probably maybe, maybe there's no argument here, that he is the greatest of the apostles, the most devoted, the most zealous, the one who sacrificed the most for Christ's cause. And the reason is because Paul <laughs> loved the Lord. Uh, when he writes in Romans 5, verse 5, that the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us, he certainly included himself in that. He had that faith, he told the Galatians, that works by love. That's why he trusted Christ. That's why he served him. And I think when he wrote 1 Corinthians 13, remember how inspiration works. You know, God doesn't just dictate. Um, to his authors what he wants them to write down, although in the Old Testament certainly there were occasions where he did that. But in the New Testament, you know, there's more going on in this. The writers are writing from their own experience and they're writing into a situation God would have them to write and he superintends them by the Holy Spirit making sure that what they write is without error and exactly what God wants, but it's still what they want to express. And I think when Paul wrote 1 Corinthians 13, he was writing from experience. He knew this love of God. And I think the same is true of Galatians 5, 22 through 23. Remember the fruits of the Spirit that we looked at before. Paul knew those things he, because he experienced those things. Well, this love is what kept him going in a Christward direction, giving himself wholly to him. Let me again read the passage that I read for our meditation where he writes to the Corinthians, for the love of Christ controls us. And you know, we talk about being filled with the Spirit means to be under his control. This is the same thing. To be under the control of the Holy Spirit is to be filled with love for Christ. And that is what should control us. For the love of Christ controls us, having concluded this, that one died for all, therefore all died. And he died for all so that they who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who died and rose again on their behalf. You know, as I was reading that, it, it um, dawned on me, the quote that I have from Jonathan Edwards here, I think I included it in the last two bulletins actually, because it's a very important one. But he writes this regarding himself. He says, I claim no right to myself, no right to this understanding, this will, these affections that are in me. Neither do I have any right to this body or its members, no right to this tongue, to these hands, feet, ears, or eyes. I have given myself clear away and not retained anything of my own. That's exactly what the Apostle Paul was expressing. Jesus died for us so that we may no longer live for ourselves, but for him who died and rose again on our behalf. Paul loved the Lord, and so he gave himself in this way. Now, this love, as we see in the passage that I read in Philippians, enabled Paul to let go of his past and anything he thought he had accomplished and to pursue Christ. He writes to the Philippians in Philippians 3, verses 7 and 8, But whatever things were gained to me, those things I have counted as loss for the sake of Christ. More than that, I count all things to be loss in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things. 
and count them but rubbish so that I may gain Christ. You know, as I read this passage, I realize Paul here is talking not just about his past righteousness. Certainly that he considers to be a mound of dung, all of his good works. But it's also everything that, that he had, all of his possessions compared to Christ. That's how he viewed them. So this love for Christ enabled him, empowered him to let go, first of all, of his righteousness so that he might receive the righteousness of Christ and be justified by his grace through faith alone, but it enabled him to let go of everything else as well that he might possess Christ. Now, it doesn't mean that he necessarily liquidated everything he had and he was you know, absolutely barren. But I think he means the same thing that Jesus is referring to in, the, in the, the kingdom parables, in the two that are perhaps the most challenging to us. And I think it's exactly what Paul is expressing here, where Jesus says in Matthew 13, verse 44, the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in the field, which a man found and hid again, and from joy over it, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. You know, Jesus talks about the fact that if we're going to be his disciples, we must give up everything. And if we have the grace of the Holy Spirit that gives us this love that opens our eyes and shows us the kingdom, we will see its value and its worth. And we'll be willing to let go of everything in order that we might have him. The second parable is, is again, teaching the same point. In, in verses 45 and 46, again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking fine pearls. And upon finding one pearl of great value, he went and sold all that he had and bought it. Again, giving up everything for this one precious thing, this one precious object, which is the kingdom of heaven, but more specifically, it's to know Christ in that saving relationship. Remember what Jesus said to the crowds in Luke 14, verse 33, none of you can be my disciple who does not give up all his own possessions. And again, when we, when we think about what he's saying there, he's not saying do X and then you'll get Y, right? Give up your possessions and I'll give you the kingdom. But what he's saying is if you have the love of the Spirit of God in your heart, you will. And that shows that the kingdom of heaven belongs to you. Well, Paul had that love and he was willing to give up everything and count it as nothing compared to Christ. Again, even those closest to him, everything, okay, is a distant second. Well, love moved Paul to want to know him. That's the reason why he was giving up everything was that he might know him. Now, again, remember, he didn't want to simply know about him. He didn't want to just study the Old Testament to find out every reference he could to Christ and how it pictured him in every way and every prophecy and every picture and every event. That's important, okay? It's important that we know those things. That certainly enriched Paul's ministry. That's why we read our Bibles. That's why we listen to teachings specifically about Christ and the gospel. That's why we read books about him. We need to know who he is. But I want you to note that Paul says, that he wanted to know him. He wanted to know him, not just about him, but wanted to know him. Remember what Jesus says about eternal life. This is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Uh, I've used this illustration before, but it's the difference between somebody who is a political scientist, somebody who's involved in political science, who researches to know the president, you know, what his policies are, in any given area to know about him, okay? Versus the gardener who works at the White House, who sees him every day and has a relationship with the president. He knows him. See, it's in that second sense that Paul is referring. But I think he means something even, you know, something even deeper than that, doesn't he? Because Paul took this much further. It wasn't enough merely to be in a relationship with him, he wanted to know Jesus experientially. You know, he wanted to know or experience what Christ experienced, what it was to walk in his shoes. He says in, in Philippians 3, verses 10 and 11, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death in order that I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. You know, Jesus 
learned obedience through the things he suffered. And Paul wanted to learn the same things, taking the same path that Jesus took. Okay? He wanted to experience the power of his resurrection, and I think what he means by that is not that he wants to be raised from the dead on that final day, though he does talk about that. But the power of his resurrection is the power the Spirit of God gives, because the Spirit is the one who raised Jesus from the dead. He wants to experience that kind of power in his life, in his service for Christ. And by the way, the only way we experience this kind of power is not by praying for it, hoping for it, waiting for it, and once we find it, then we go out and serve the Lord, but we, we do it by serving the Lord. And then we begin to experience that power as we step out in faith to do what he calls us to do. So he wanted to know the power of his resurrection. He wanted to know something that I think few of us really want to know, but this is something that this is the only way to learn Christ, and that is the fellowship of his sufferings. He wanted to suffer. You know, Christ learned through what he suffered, and Paul wanted, again, to take that same path, he wanted to suffer in the cause of Christ as Christ had suffered for us. He wanted to know the fellowship. You know, when you suffer for Christ, not just suffer for some wrongdoing that you've done, but actually suffer because you're doing the right thing for Christ, there is a kind of fellowship that comes from that with Christ and with God. And he wanted to experience that closeness, that nearness. He says he wanted to be conformed to his death. Uh, perhaps that he would be willing to die as Jesus died, but as Jesus died to everything but the Father's will, okay? That's what he wanted to, to do as well. Uh, even as he expresses in Romans chapter 6, we've died with Christ and we were raised with Christ. Now, in order to live only for his glory. And I think this idea of, of, of knowing the power of his resurrection and being conformed to his death has to do with this experiencing this power. And then this, this last statement, which may sound a bit strange, he says, that I might attain to the resurrection of the dead. It almost again sounds like Paul saying, I have to do X in order to get Y. But I think what he's saying here is that when I seek the Lord in this way, to experience his power, to experience his sufferings, to experience his his sacrifice in, in virtually every way, this confirms to him that he does belong to Jesus and he will attain to the resurrection of the dead. And by the way, everyone's going to be raised, we know, but he's talking about the resurrection of the righteous. So Paul was desiring a full assurance and a full assurance comes by taking the path that Jesus took. You know, when Jesus was calling his disciples and he said, follow me, we know he meant much more than just, you know, where I'm going, just follow after me and go to the same place as I go. He wanted them to follow his example. And that's exactly what Paul is doing here, isn't it? He is following the Lord's example because he loves him. And that's what love will move us to do, follow the Lord's example. Now, Paul's love moved him to pursue this knowledge through his service. Again, we, we talked about that, but... Paul really threw himself into this, didn't he? He gave everything he had. He outstripped all the other apostles, it appears, uh, from what we know in Scripture. He writes to the Corinthians, at least what, what he considered about himself. He says in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 9 and 10, For I am the least of the apostles and not fit to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace toward me did not prove vain, but I labored even more than all of them. Yet not I, but the grace of God with me. So this is my basis for saying that Paul outstripped all the other apostles. This was his perception of what he was doing. And by the way, he also gives us in this passage one of the secrets of his love and zeal for the Lord, and that is God's grace. Remember how Jesus says, those who are forgiven much, love much. Paul knew what he was, you know. I, I am not fit to be an apostle because I persecuted the church of, of God. He, he arrested people. He tried to destroy the church. 
you know, when, when the Christians were being put on trial, he cast his vote against them. He held, uh, watched the coats of those who were stoning them. He had committed terrible crimes, so he knew the depths of his crimes against the Lord, but now he knew the blessing of God's grace, that all of those sins were forgiven, and the Lord was willing to use him in his kingdom. I mean, in his fleshly way, even as a Pharisee, he wanted to be used by God, but now he truly would be as he takes the gospel, and that made him thankful. So thankfulness is certainly a part of what makes us love the Lord. Um, you know, uh, he also, in his service, we would say, he suffered more than the other apostles. I, I think of just one example where he talks to the Galatians, and he's, he's asking the question, actually answering the question for them, why should you listen to me rather than the Judaizers, you know, these Jewish so-called believers who wanted to add the law of Moses and circumcision to the gospel, destroying the gospel. Why should you listen to me? Well, he says, from now on in, in chapter 6, verse 17, from now on, let no one cause trouble for me, for I bear on my body the brand marks of Jesus. Why should you listen to me? Well, I have my, basically my evidence is in my body. All that I have suffered for him. Jesus said that those who, who loved him and followed him would suffer for him, and I have suffered. Uh, these are the marks of my apostleship, okay? So his scars were the evidence also of his love and his devotion to Christ. Now, can, can, you know, we may not have suffered these scars in the service of Christ, but do we have at least the same kind of motivation Paul had for serving the Lord in that God has forgiven us also of our guilt? Now, it's been said that, um, you know, um, it, when we compare sinners with regard to our levels of guilt, you know, we're all infinitely removed from God by our guilt, and the difference between us is only minor. You know, between us, it's only minor, but between us, all of us, and God, it's, it's infinite. And God has forgiven us infinite guilt, even as He forgave Paul. We may not think we were so bad. But in God's eyes, we were. And so as those who have been forgiven much, shouldn't we also be thankful much? And how do we show that thankfulness? But by serving Him. So this is, again, what, how the love of God, the love of Christ works itself out in, in Paul's life. But we need to recognize that Paul also, like David, you know, loved Christ's people. He loved them very strongly very intimately, and he uses a, an image that is perhaps the most powerful example of, of love that we have outside of the father giving his son, of course, but as a mother loves her children. First Thessalonians 2, verses 7 and 8, but we prove to be gentle among you as a nursing mother tenderly cares for her own children. Having so fond an affection for you, we were well pleased to impart to you not only the gospel of God but also our own lives because you had become very dear to us. So the love the Spirit of God gives to us works itself out by creating within us a love for those who are like Christ. I mean, John talks about that in his first letter, that those who love God will love their brothers also. We saw this morning that David not only delighted in God, but he also delighted in the saints because... They're like Him. So, loving God, we will love one another as well. Now, Paul not only loved the saints, he also, as we know, had a very powerful love for God's old covenant people. Remember the Jews? And they were his enemies, okay? Now, um, not just, you know, the, the Jews that weren't attacking him, but the ones that were, he loved them all to the point of being willing to be condemned in their place if that was possible. But we know it wasn't. Now, it was possible for Christ. Christ was condemned in our place, but His sacrifice actually removed that condemnation for all of us and for Himself, and so it did not keep Him in the grave. Paul was saying, I'd be willing to be cast away for the sake of the Jews if they could be saved. 
He says in Romans 9, verses 1 through 3, I am telling the truth in Christ, I am not lying. My conscience testifies with me in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and unceasing grief in my heart, for I could wish that I myself were accursed, separated from Christ, for the sake of my brethren, my kinsmen according to the flesh. You know, as I read this, I think about uh, it, it was a, a, a belief, uh, a teaching that was prevalent during the days of Jonathan Edwards, which was interesting, something that he said was true of his wife, and that is that, that she was so in love with the Lord and so swallowed up for his glory that she would be willing to be damned if that would bring him glory. And Jonathan Edwards said, well, no, no believer can actually desire to be damned because you want to be with the Lord. And yet I, I read this passage from uh, Paul. Sounds to me like that's what he's saying. Although in this case, it's on their behalf. So I guess you might say, in a sense, he's following in the footsteps of Christ, isn't he? Christ is willing to be condemned for us. He's saying, I'm being willing, I'm willing to be condemned for my brethren who hate me and who persecute me. And I think as we look at the book of Acts, we would say that Paul had that same kind of love and zeal for the Gentiles. That passage that I just read about his loving care and tenderness, he wasn't talking about a you know, Jewish church. It was talking about, I think, primarily Gentiles, but there were Jews among them as well. As we know from Scripture, love will move us to show mercy to our enemies. And to what degree will we want to show them mercy. Jesus prayed on the cross for forgiveness for those who had crucified him. Paul is saying, I'll take the place of my, my Jewish brethren who hate me, uh, and I'll be accursed in their place. Uh, so it's, it's a pretty great degree of mercy the Lord is calling us to give, but this is what the love of God will prompt us to do and, and move us towards, and that is, is pretty humbling, isn't it? Well, finally, Paul's love for Jesus gave him the desire to be with him. I think we're very familiar with that in, in Philippians 1, verses 21 through 23. He says, for me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. But if I am to live on in the flesh, this will mean fruitful labor for me. And I do not know which to choose, but I am hard-pressed from both directions, having the desire to depart and be with Christ. For that is very much better. So if Paul had the choice, it almost sounds like he did have a choice, but if, if this is just hypothetical, okay, Paul would rather be with Jesus. And I understand the Philippian uh, letter is one of the prison epistles, if I'm not mistaken, so perhaps he has execution in mind. Um, I'd rather be executed so I can be with Christ. But if I'm not, if I'm exonerated, if I'm let, set free, I will continue to serve him. Well, again, that's what... The love God gives us will, will cause us to do, will, will give us a desire for. If we love God more than anything else, then why wouldn't we want to be with Him in heaven? Now again, having said all these things, remember, this is the degree of love that Paul had, that um, David had, that, um, that, that is attainable, but not all the saints have attained this, right? But it is a possibility and what we ought to be striving after. And let me just read in conclusion, um, again, a summary that Edwards gives of Paul's example. And by the way, all of this that I've just given you doesn't come necessarily from religious affections. He does use Paul as an example, but he just gives this, this, um, this paragraph. And, and so we've just kind of filled it out a little bit. But this kind of helps to summarize what we've seen. So he says this, and it appears by his, that is Paul's whole history, after his conversion in the Acts, and also by all his epistles and the accounts he gives of himself, uh, himself there in the epistles, that the affection of zeal as having the cause of his master and the interest and prosperity of his church for its object was mighty in him, continually inflaming his heart, strongly engaging to those great and constant labors he went through, in instructing, exhorting, warning, and reproving others, travailing in birth with them, conflicting with those powerful and innumerable enemies who continually opposed him, wrestling with principalities and powers, uh, 
not fighting as one who beats the air, running the race set before him, continually pressing forwards through all manner of difficulties and sufferings, so that others thought him quite beside himself. Now, if anyone can consider these accounts given in the scripture of this great apostle, and which he gives of himself, and, not, and yet not see that his religion consisted much in affection, must have a strange faculty of managing his eyes to shut out the light which shines most full in his face. So again, the point Edwards wanted to make is, look, look at what religious affections are. He would say, and again, he, he would say this at the end of his book, that it is what we do that really reveals that we have this love. But he also believes it to be the most powerful apologetic and testimony that God has given to the world that Christ is real and that he is the Messiah. And that is in the way that he changes our lives. Okay, so that's what he's seeking in us. Now, Paul showed that he loved the Father and his Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. He showed that he loved his church, his kingdom, his people, with the love that God had put in his heart by the Holy Spirit. And if we want to experience more of what he experienced, we need to grow in love because that is the difference between Paul and ourselves, is the degree of love that he had for the Lord. Well, let's, um, let's spend just a, a few moments in silent prayer and let's ask for the Lord's grace that we might grow in this love.